get a scripture passage from Exodus chapter 15, a few verses from 22 through 27. Exodus 15. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name was called Marah. I have to remember where, where I just put my little clicker, sorry. Here we go. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statue and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statues, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees, and so they encamped there by the waters. Lord bless this reading of his word. My message today is uh, life in the wilderness, the teaching and testing of the Lord. And so again, I say good morning and welcome to each of you. I am uh, glad that you're here. And over the past several weeks, we've been uh, traveling, as it were, through the book of Exodus. And Exodus is such an amazing book, so much wonderful uh, nuggets of truth and life for us there. And I want to do a quick review of where we've come from. Uh, Exodus chapter 1 begins with uh, the retelling of the conditions that existed in Egypt after many years after Joseph had brought salvation to Egypt and to so many in that part of the world because of the famine that was to come. The children of Israel grew in number and then the leadership of Egypt began to oppress them and, and began to beat on them and to enslave them and put them into hard labor. The Pharaoh came to power and he gave orders even that all the male children born were to be put to death. And in chapter 2 we're introduced to that family that parents who defied this order of the king and they gave birth to a son and they hid that son for three months and, and then in faith they put him in a basket and put him among the reeds where the princess, Pharaoh's daughter, came to bathe. And there she found the little child in the basket and she, she loved him and she adopted him and she named him Moses. And we see later in chapter 2 as he grew up, became a man, that he became concerned with how the Egyptians were treating the Hebrews and he even saw such terrible abuse that he went out and tried to intervene and stop that abuse and, and restrained one of the taskmasters and, and ended up killing him. And then Moses fled into the wilderness of Midian. And there he lived as a shepherd for 40 years until one, one day he, he saw a sight that just was wild. He saw a bush that was on fire. It was burning, but it wasn't consumed. And Moses went over to that bush to look at it closely. And when he came near, there God spoke to him from the bush, this burning bush. And God said to him that he was going to use Moses to deliver the children of Israel from their bondage of slavery in Egypt. And then we saw from chapters 4 through 11 that Moses was sent back to Pharaoh and to tell Pharaoh that God has said, let my people go. And that if he would not, that he would bring on him plagues. And so for the next six chapters, there were ten plagues that God brought upon the nation of Egypt. And these plagues brought Pharaoh to submission. And then in chapters 11 and 12, uh, we were introduced to the Passover. And here at the Passover, God was going to bring one final tenth plague, and this plague would be the death of the firstborn. 
But for the Hebrews, for the Israelites, God said, I'm going to protect you through this, that you're to take a lamb and you're to sacrifice this lamb and take the blood and put it on the doorpost. And then when I come through with the avenger of death that comes through the land of Egypt, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you and you'll be spared. And so the Passover was implemented and the people of Israel were spared. Their lives were spared from death of the firstborn. And last week we came to chapter 14 and there we saw the gripping drama of Israel being, after coming out of the land and making their way toward the sea, there they found themselves hemmed in by mountains and sea. And suddenly Pharaoh, feeling like he had let something go that he didn't want to, he came chasing after them. And he came chasing after them, and God then opened the sea. And the nation of Israel marched through the sea on dry land, and they walked through. But when Egypt chased after them, God brought the waters, got the waters down onto the Egyptians, and all of them perished. So this morning we pick up the trip as they travel out into the Exodus away from Egypt and on toward the promised land. And in chapter 15 uh, begins with this amazing celebration following this victory of going through the water and having their enemies destroyed by the waters. Moses sang songs that the people followed in rejoicing in their deliverance and Miriam led songs for the women and they praised God. Then they camped by the sea for a period of time and then the Lord said, move on. And so Moses led them out and they began to move into the wilderness. And so this section I'm calling life in the wilderness. In here, there's going to be a series of things that will happen to them, which are lessons for us as it was for them. How long they stayed by the sea, we aren't told, but it seems like perhaps a few days. And then they move on and they begin traveling. The cloud and the pillar went before them and leading them out. And Moses led the people following the cloud. We read in verse 22, And Moses led the Israelites from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. Think about this. After these great victories, (laughs) they're marching out into a wilderness. A wilderness very arid and dry. And we aren't told exactly how long all of the uh, deliberations were at the, at the sea, but as they left for three days, they traveled and found no water. Great deliverance out of slavery. The armies of Egypt were destroyed. A time of rest and then they move on. And no one knows the exact locations of the places where Israel went. Uh, It's in a desert. There's not many markers there. But somehow they move along into this wilderness region. And as I mentioned, uh, there are about 50 locations that are described in the book of Exodus. And of those, we only know for sure where three of them are. The rest are names, but we can't really say exactly where they were. But they travel through the wilderness three days. They do not find any water. Not only was this difficult for the people, but it would have been for their animals too. You know, days with no water. And I assume that by the time they came to the end of the third day, uh, they were running out of their water. Whatever they had carried with them, they were probably at the very end of it. And they were exhausted after days of traveling. And to their great delight, they see up ahead some palm trees, evidence of water. And they see that there's a spring there. An oasis that meant water. And they longed for water that was up ahead of them. But when they arrived and draw some out and begin to drink it, ah, oh, they had spit it out. They couldn't drink it. It was bitter. This is a picture, an aerial view of uh, that region. And you can see this is where they left. And they went out through here. And they're now in the desert wilderness there. This gives you some other views of what that wilderness is like as they had crossed over the Red Sea and they're on the other side now. 
When I was traveling through the Sinai, I took a lot of pictures and they all looked the same. <laughs> Desert. That's kind of what it looks like. Just a lot of dirt and rocks. <laughs> but they finally come to water, but they couldn't drink it. That water was called Mara, which means bitter. Mara, the word means bitter. And whether it was already had that name or they gave it that name, we don't know, but it was such a great disappointment. You come upon water in a desert and then not be able to drink it. How would you react to such a disappointment? You know, our lives are, are filled with encounters with disappointment. We all face and come to disappointments in life. And you know, the scriptures are a picture of life, aren't they? And, and we're, as we read the Bible, we see that there were so many people that encountered those kind of same disappointments that we encounter. Many of you are familiar with the story of Naomi. Naomi had a family, a husband and two sons, but there came a time when there was a famine in the land. And so her husband, Elimelech, he took the family and they, they went east to where there was food and they moved into the land of Moab. And in time, her husband died. And a while later, both of her sons died. And Naomi was left alone. And so she made the decision to go back home, to her home in Bethlehem. And as she traveled back home, the people saw her coming and said, Oh, here comes Naomi. And she said, Don't call me Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. She goes, Call me Mara. Bitter. I went out full and I've come back empty. You know, we encounter times of sorrow and disappointment and heartache. And as I say, the scriptures are filled of those. Uh, we think of Hannah, who was barren, and her husband's other wife criticized her and mocked her endlessly because of her barrenness. We think of the life of, life of Job, who was embittered by the afflictions that he faced and the psalmist in Psalm 42 cried out and said, tears were his food day and night. Some of us were present to watch the movie at the Parsonage on Friday night and we watched the story of Esther. And when the command came to kill all the Jews, Mordecai, the scribe, got the news first on and he wept in bitterness. He tore his clothes and he put ashes in his hair. And he cried out with bitter tears. Bitterness, Mara. We all go through times of sorrow and disappointment. Bitter waters. Verse 24 gives us the reaction of the people. By the way, this is when I came to the spring when I was walking through the desert and we saw the palm trees and we saw the spring and we learned that this was Mara. Well, how did the people react? The people grumbled against Moses. They tried drinking it and they couldn't drink it and they said to Moses, what are we to drink? You've brought us out here to die. The people were weary from three days of traveling in the desert without water. And now had come upon water, but it was not drinkable, and they were deeply disappointed. They grumbled. They murmured. They complained against Moses. And we'll notice that there was no record of their complaining in the previous three days. As long as they had water, they didn't. But they came upon water, and their relief turns to distress, finding the source of water only to taste that it is bitter. And they broke down. Would we have done differently? The stresses of those days of journeying and then finding water but not be drinkable. It's easy to sing and be joyful uh, over the victories and when they saw the Egyptians destroyed by the waters and God brought deliverance, it was easy to sing. But their voices of praise turned to voices of complaint. This is Mara. 
This is bitterness. Waters of Mara. The people were weary and they were disappointed. They were frustrated and they lashed out to Moses, their leader. Mara. Bitterness. The waters were bitter and their hearts were bitter. You know, and Mara is an example of life's disappointments. And we all get them. Experiences can be hard to bear sometimes and they can become doubly bitter when they come back to back. They can rob us of the solace that we expected. This sometimes this happens when friends and family fail us or when God seems distant. Maybe it feels like he's deserted us and he grants no answers to our prayers. These waters that we drink at that time are mara, they're bitter. But why does God lead us to such a place? Why does God bring into our lives Mara? Why does God seem to even lead us to these very experiences? You know, those are good questions that we should wrestle with. Why does God allow these kinds of things in our lives? I want you to think about that. Why does God lead us to those bitter waters? I, I hope that we'll think that question through because there's an answer. And I think we find the answer here in this passage of Scripture, and the answer to these and deeper questions. What was God's desire in permitting Israel to suffer hardship here? He had a purpose. He wanted them to suffer and feel this experience because he was testing them and he was teaching them. And every week in this journey through Exodus, I have been explaining that this is all a process of God teaching Israel who he was, teaching them who they were, teaching them to learn to trust him, to come to depend upon him. And they had to feel hurts and disappointments and bitterness to come to the place where they would come to look to him to solve those needs. They had to look to him. And so God leads them even to this bitter water. He leads them in that direction and puts them in that place. We know that God had the power to supply all their needs, but he permitted them to taste suffering. He permitted them to go through it in extreme privations. God was teaching them. Israel was in the process of being delivered from their bondage in Egypt, but had more to be delivered from and more to learn. In his first lesson that he was teaching them, God was teaching them that he's the God who saves. He was the God who saves. And God showed Israel that he was the God who saves first through the Passover. And they were saved by trusting God, obeying God, and putting the blood on the doorpost. And then as they obeyed God and they marched out and they went to the place God led them, which looked impossible, God saved them again by opening the sea and bringing them through. And Moses said to the people, this enemy that's chasing you, you'll never see them again. And soon the waters came over and destroyed and wiped out the armies of Egypt. Indeed, they would never see them alive again. God was teaching them. He was showing them he's the God who saves. He saved them from the bondage from Pharaoh. And he was teaching Israel to depend on him. To not be independent and self-sufficient, but to depend on him. He was teaching them about himself and about relationship that he wanted to have with them. Notice these words of Moses and the reaction of Moses. When the people cried out and grumbled, notice the reaction of Moses. Moses cried out to the Lord. Moses lifted up his heart in prayer. Moses shows a very consistent pattern in all the troubles and encounters that he would face through decades of challenges in the desert. Moses is truly quite remarkable. And although he too could have grumbled, instead Moses prayed. He sought help from the Lord. And indeed, this is what the Lord desires for all of his people. 
He desires that we would look to him. And the rest of the verse shows how God answered. So Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. The waters were made sweet. In response to the prayer that God, uh, that Moses lifted to God, God showed him a tree. And this tree would be the tool that God would use to change the waters from bitter to sweet. The NIV says that the waters became fit to drink. He made the water sweet. The rest of the verse 25 and 26 give us some helpful understanding. I want you to see again as I've asked the question, why did God do this? Why did he bring them through these disappointments, hardships and difficulties? It was there the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. And he said, if you will listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you will pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. God was showing Israel how to live, how to walk with him, how to receive blessings. Why did God allow his people to suffer? Here we see it was, at least in part, he was teaching them. He was using it as instruction, teaching his people, teaching them how to live and walk with him. We also read that he put them to the test. He was testing their willingness to obey. When things aren't going well, it's easy uh, to grumble and complain. When they're going well, it's easy to be upbeat and happy. We can be confident and we're pretty spiritually strong when things are going well. But most of us here are old enough to know that life is not an easy path without problems. Although we can often expect things to go smoothly, experience shows that that's not the way life is. When you're the older ones, say amen. <laughs> I have a little cartoon I want to show you that I think depicts this. Okay, the top one is your plan. Zzz, to the finish line, right? But friends, here's God's plan. That's God's plan. Like Israel experienced, we often go from a triumph or a mountaintop experience into a trial. We often come to places of Mara, bitterness, sorrow and disappointment. This life is not one of a continuous high or a straight line. There are ups and downs. And why does God lead us that way? It's to teach us. It's to teach you and me to depend on him, to lean into him, to obey him, to help us to grow. And I believe that just as God brought Israel through the desert with hardships, into hardships, into difficulties, and through difficulties, it was part of their training. It's sort of like, were any of you in the military? <laughs> and they send you off to boot camp, and it's hard. It's difficult. It's training. This is the third time in a matter of weeks that Israel has faced a severe hardship. You know, when Moses first came back from the wilderness to Egypt to announce to Pharaoh God's plan, how did things go? Uh, they went from bad to worse, didn't they? Moses came to Pharaoh and demanded that he let God's people go. And Pharaoh says, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let heavier work be laid on them, on the men, that it may be that they may labor at it. The people said to Moses, the Lord look on you and judge because you've made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. So after Moses comes back and brings the good news, God's going to deliver you, and I'm here to help make that happen, things went worse. And the Egyptians threw them into hard labor. Part of God's teaching and testing. 
Eventually, Pharaoh did let them go. And then days later, Pharaoh changed his mind and he, and he chased after them down into the desert where they were now by the sea. And again, the people were put in a difficult place and hemmed in, being chased by an army with weaponry. The people were overcome with fear and they complained. <laughs> they complained. And so we read that as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them and they were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. Was it because there were no graves back in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? I must say they had a pessimistic attitude, didn't they? <laughs> what have you done bringing us out here, out of Egypt? They had to learn that God was going to protect them. They had to learn that God was going to provide for them and they had to be put under stress to see it. But here the people grumbled at Moses again. And now in today's lesson, we read about the third occasion. They've now come three days of traveling without water and they come to waters, but the waters were bitter. God was teaching them, teaching them who God was because they had lived four centuries in a pagan land with false gods. He was teaching them about himself, about who God really is. He was showing them that he was the God who saves He's the God who heals, and here he healed the waters. Here God showed Moses a tree to put in the water. And when he does so in obedience to what God says, the waters are healed. God intended this healing to be a sign for Israel, a proof that he has the ability and willingness to heal them and all heal of all their natural and spiritual diseases. And here, he, for the first time, he names himself Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. For Israel, God was teaching them and testing them. What was God's purpose? It was to teach them about himself. And that Mara experience was part of that teaching. And he was teaching them, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear or pay attention to his commandments and keep his statutes, I'll put none of those diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Each of the people named earlier, God also healed their bitterness. With Naomi, God gave her a faithful daughter-in-law, Ruth, who became the wife of Boaz, who provided for them and brought joy into the life of Naomi, and she could be called Naomi again. Pleasant. God brought her joy out of her bitterness. And Job, after his days of bitterness, his health was restored, his prosperity restored, and joy came back into his life as he had ten more children and the most beautiful daughters in the land. Hannah's prayers were answered. Out of her bitterness, she bore a son. Mordecai, from his bitterness and weeping, God brought about Esther's plea with the king, God heard their prayers, Jehovah, Rapha. Why did Moses show Moses, why did God show Moses a tree? And why did he use a tree to heal the waters? We aren't told exactly, but perhaps this tree may have represented the cross. When we bring the cross of Christ into our bitter experiences of life, the waters of bitterness that we're tasting can be made sweet. As we draw close to the Lord, as we go through trials of bitter waters, when we identify with Christ in his suffering, death and resurrection, we really begin to live in close fellowship with the Lord. And that brings sweetness into our life. The final verse of this passage is verse 27, and it says, uh, Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they encamped near the water. And you know, this Elam is a picture of our journey in life, times of refreshment. We go through these difficult times and God brings us through, and Elam too is a picture of this journey of life, and we go from sorrow to some gladness, from tears to some smiles, and a new, a new season, of comfort 
God brings us into that. And here Elam is a, a place of cool shade under trees in a, in a hot desert and abundant waters for they and their flocks and rest and refreshment. I came to a place that was associated with Elam and there were all those palm trees and there were all those springs of water and uh, my son and I walked about through there and it was just a beautiful place and it was very refreshing. Then the Lord led them out again from Elam. Elam is a picture of this life journey and after they arrived in this place of rest, that was not their final rest. It was not their final stop. God was teaching lessons. God had chosen a route for them, and he chose a route for us too. It was all a part of his plan to reveal himself and to teach them to depend on him. The entire journey of the children of Israel from Egypt to Canaan, the Bible teaches us is a spiritual picture of the Christian life. Every event in the life of a Christian somehow relates to the life of Israel as they traveled from Egypt to the land of Canaan. And so studying the Pentateuch and studying the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, we learn and are given so much instruction. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote these words. He said, again, our journey. All these things happen to them, the Israelites, are written for our admonition, for our learning, for our instruction. All of those things are recorded for us to study, to look at, to learn from, so that we too can be instructed and learn how to walk with the Lord. The Greek word that is translated examples can also be uh, types. They were examples for us. They were types for us. And I'm thankful that the Lord is patient with us he teaches us, but not every lesson all at once. He gives us time to absorb those lessons. We go to the place of Mara, and we learn a lesson. But then he brings us to Elam, and we get some refreshment, and we get to relax and enjoy. But then he brings us back to another one, so we will keep learning lessons to walk with him. God not only, not only permits us to go through trials, he actually leads us to them, to learn to seek him, to learn to trust him. But then we're brought to seasons of refreshing by him to support and strengthen and comfort us. And Elam stops are, they're not destinations. They came to Elam and they stayed there for a few days. Wouldn't it be nice just to stay there? Hey, isn't it great right here? It's like being at a Christian conference. It's wonderful. But that's a refreshment. It's not where we're to stay. He has other plans for us. These plans are for us to grow in our faith. And Peter puts it this way. Now, though for a little while, you may have had to suffer. These have come that the genuineness or proof of your faith is much more precious than gold, which perishes even though tested by fire. It's because of these tests that he brings us through results in praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus. When we experience bitter waters of life, we should hold off on complaining the best we can, as somebody mentioned in prayer earlier. Instead, we should recognize that God, in his perfect and sovereign ways, has allowed us to taste those bitter waters. He's allowed those bitter waters to come our way for a reason, so that our faith can be tested. And as we persevere in our faith, our faith is proven genuine, real. And that's more precious than gold that perishes. And in time, it'll result in the praise, honor, and glory in our Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again for this passage for this illustration and example that shows us what you did in teaching Israel, who you are, and how to walk with you, Lord. Thank you that you're showing us so that we can learn better and better how to walk with you, how to go through the difficulties and the hardships, how to experience those seasons of refreshment and recognize that that's not the last stop, but there's a great day coming 
when you'll return and set up your kingdom. That's when we'll finally be with you. Oh, how we look forward to that day, but help us, Lord, to be faithful as we journey. In Jesus' name, amen.